go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the second University of Washington Nephrology Grand Rounds of the academic year. We have great Grand Rounds this morning. Our first speaker uh, is Dr. Nayan Aurora, uh, followed by visiting professor Dr. David Leaf, who I see has already joined this morning. Hi, David. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will uh, turn things over to Nayan. Go ahead. Right. That look okay? Uh, yep, looks great. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for waking up early for my portion of Grand Round before we get to Dr. Leaf. Um, the title of my talk is Low Sodium Diets and Heart Failure, How Low is Too Low? This is kind of a natural extension of my talk from last year where I talked about the benefits of giving hypertonic saline to patients with acute decompensated heart failure as inpatients. And essentially the logical next question I had was, well, if it works inpatient, why not outpatient? And uh, probably like many of you, I know that I recommend a lot of low sodium and low salt diets. And so this was essentially an exercise for me to figure out, you know, where did that come from and, and should I be doing that with a particular emphasis on patients with heart failure? So this is the outline. Um, I couldn't resist putting in some historical context, uh, so bear with me there. Uh, and then the remainder of the talk is essentially a progression of how I went through this, uh, looking at the association of um, salt with hypertension, salt with um, cardiovascular outcomes, and then finally salt uh, specifically in patients with congestive heart failure. And before that, I wasn't sophisticated enough to uh, do a poll, uh, but I was curious from folks what level of dietary sodium restriction you recommend for your patients with heart failure. Um, these are just some of the options, so under 3 grams, under 2.3 grams, under 1.5 grams, or something else. Um, I think for me, when I was thinking about this, it seems I tend to recommend uh, a, a sodium restriction of 2,300 milligrams or 2.3 grams. I don't know where that comes from. Um, I, I think somebody probably told me that at some point and I went with it, uh, but I'm curious what, what other people do. And we know from an evolutionary perspective, salt is very important, right? For, for a variety of biological processes, and in fact, when during evolution from sea to land, salt conservation was vital to survival. And actually Homer Smith and from Fish to Philosopher wrote the tenacious conservation of salt is one of the most primitive, if not the most primitive of functions in the vertebrate kidney. And not just from a biological perspective, but evolutionarily from a cultural perspective, salt was very important to early civilizations. In fact, uh, the location of civilizations was often determined based on access to salt. Um, and there's whole books written about this, but a few kind of random facts I found interesting. So China uh, was is the first mentioned of having a salt tax going all the way back to the 20th century BC. Uh, they actually used some of those proceeds to pay for construction of the Great Wall. Uh, Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. That's where we get the term salary that's still used today. And actually Romans would uh, increase the salt tax as needed in order to pay for um, wars. And even in the War of 1812, some American soldiers were paid uh, in salt brine as well. And I tried, but I couldn't resist. Uh, I ran across uh, some things about salt during the Civil War. It actually played a relatively prominent role. So there's a monthly allowance for Confederate soldiers of 680 grams a month. Uh, that comes out to about 22 grams of salt a day. And General George Sherman, who's pictured here, he's most famous for the uh, Sherman March across um, uh, Georgia, uh, but he actually urged federal authorities to declare salt as contraband during the war. And uh, he felt that limiting access to salt was just as important as limiting access to gunpowder. And there was a, a battle in Saltville. So in 1864, Union forces actually made a forced march and fought a 36 hour battle to capture Saltville, which was the most important salt works for the Confederate army. Uh, they had failed a few months prior and then they succeeded. And so Confederate soldiers uh, started boiling seawater in Florida, which was Florida's most uh, you know, biggest contribution to the war and Union and navies would come across shore every now and then to destroy them. And some historians think that because of uh, this, this kept the, the Confederate army occupied, it, it uh, contributed to a Union victory. But since evolution, we know that dietary salt intake has changed dramatically. So if you go back to 
Paleolithic times here, it's estimated that that dietary salt intake was less than a gram. Uh, conversely, potassium intake was 16 to 20 times what it is now. Um, about 5,000 years ago is where um, uh, people started adding salt to food. And the Egyptians started using salt as food preservation um, in 2000 BC, maybe earlier, but, but at least there's record in 2000 BC, which really became the most important function of salt for a long time. About a thousand years ago, salt intake grew to about five grams a day. Uh, it's estimated that in Sweden in the 16th century, people were ingesting upwards of a hundred grams a day because of how much salted fish they would eat. Uh, and in the 19th century, Europeans were eating around 18 grams a day. And then that started to fall in the 20th century to about 10 grams a day. And that coincided with the emergence of refrigeration. So um, uh, making it so that salt was less important in terms of uh, food preservation. The last time I, I, or the most recent article I could find about this in 2018 uh, in JAMA using NHANES data was estimated that uh, dietary sodium intake in US adults was around 3.6 grams, so it really hasn't changed that much. And worldwide dietary sodium intake was 3.6 to four uh, grams. And we all know we have the patients that come in and say, well, doc, I don't, I don't use a salt shaker, um, but that's not where the majority of, of sodium is coming from. So in 2017 in circulation, uh, there was a study estimating what the dietary sodium sources are. And in that 71%, it was found that 71% of sodium was added outside the home, particularly in food processing. And I was surprised this hasn't changed that much. Um, so in 1991, a similar study showed that it was about 77% uh, was added in the, in the form of food processing. Uh, in the 70s, uh, a study showed that it was closer to 30 to 40%. Uh, and only 5% of dietary sodium uh, comes from people actually adding salt uh, at the table, which is relevant to a lot of discussions I think we have with patients. And different societies have different recommendations. They don't all agree. So the CDC recommends uh, 2,300 milligram limit of dietary sodium. Uh, the AHA is more restrictive at 1,500 milligrams and the WHO sits somewhere in the middle at, at 2,000 milligrams. But all of this is grade C evidence. And so the question is why? Well, there was a Cochrane review published last year, and I apologize, it's a poor slide, I couldn't find a good way to display this graphically, but it was 185 studies uh, there, where there was a medium sodium reduction from 4.7 grams to 1.5 grams a day. With that reduction in sodium, there was a corresponding decrease in systolic and diastolic blood pressure of one millimeter mercury and zero millimeters mercury if the participant was normotensive and 5.5 millimeters mercury systolic or 2.9 millimeters mercury diastolic if a patient was hypertensive. And in the low sodium DASH diet study, so this was a multi-center uh, randomized control trial, non-blinded with uh, a little over 400 participants. The, the mean blood pressure in this study was 134 over 86. And in fact, uh, participants were excluded if their systolic blood pressure was greater than 160. Uh, they then used 24 hour urine collections to determine sodium excretion and randomized people to either a 1.1 gram sodium diet, which was the low sodium diet, 2.3 grams, which was intermediate and 3.5 grams, which was the high sodium diet. They then further randomized folks to uh, that degree of sodium intake and a quote unquote typical American diet versus the DASH diet. And in the figure here, so systolic blood pressure on the top, diastolic on the bottom, I'm going to ignore the DASH diet piece of it. Uh, the rationale being that we know that the DASH diet contains a lot of potassium, which has independent blood pressure lowering effects through down regulation of NCC channels, through animal models showing uh, direct vasodilation of peripheral vessels. Uh, but if you did go with the control diet from a high to intermediate sodium diet, there was a reduction in systolic blood pressure by 2.1. And if you went from the intermediate to low, so 2.3 grams to 1.1, there was an additional, additional 4.6 millimeters mercury lowering in blood pressure. So overall, it does seem that lowering sodium intake does lower blood pressure. Uh, you know, you can argue about the absolute values of that and, and how effective those are. Uh, those effects 
tend to be more prominent in patients who already are hypertensive. When it comes to actual cardiovascular outcomes, uh, the data is not quite as clear. So this was an observational study uh, published in 2011 in JAMA. This was two cohorts that were at quote unquote high risk of cardiovascular disease based on either a diagnosis of CVD or a diagnosis of diabetes. And the, this was 28,000 patients or participants. Uh, they were all over 55 years old with a mean age of 66. About 70% of this population was hypertensive and there was a median follow-up of 56 months. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, patients with uh, heart failure were excluded from this. And the primary outcome was cardiovascular death and, or cardiovascular disease and heart failure hospitalizations. And so what you see here are these spline plots with the 95% confidence intervals in the dashed lines. And what they found were these U-shaped curves, particularly for cardiovascular death here and congestive heart failure here with inflection points at greater than seven grams associated with a higher risk of both, but then also less than three grams of sodium intake had a similar uh, increase in both cardiovascular death and uh, congestive heart failure. The similar thing was not seen at least at the lower ends of sodium intake for uh, myocardial infarction or stroke. And the same group uh, published the uh, results of the PURE study three years later in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this was 102,000 participants. Mean sodium excretion in this study was 4.9 grams. Uh, again, observational. And in here, they actually excluded patients with known cardiovascular disease or if an event occurred within the first two years of the trial. Uh, only eight, excuse me, nine percent of participants in this study had diabetes. Uh, the mean age was 50, about 40 percent had hypertension, and there's a mean follow-up of 3.7 years. The primary outcome was uh, major adverse cardiovascular, cardiovascular events or death. What they found was that for every one gram of sodium excretion, as that went up, systolic blood pressure went up around one and a half millimeters mercury. They did some kind of statistical gymnastics. I couldn't really understand what that was and then spit out this number of 2.1. Uh, so somewhere in that range with each increase of sodium excretion by a gram. They found that those effects were non-linear and the increase in pressure really occurred at greater than five grams of sodium excretion. Remember these patients did not have uh, underlying, only 40% had underlying hypertension. And in terms of outcomes, uh, so this is the composite outcome of death or cardiovascular events. Again, more of a J-shaped curve this time. Really didn't see uh, a significant increase, although the incidence of both did go up after around six or seven grams of intake. But again, they saw a similar increase in events if sodium intake was under three grams. And so what that leaves us with, if you go back to the initial JAMA study estimating sodium intake, this is where we are here. And this is where all the societies want us to be in terms of sodium intake. And even if you throw out their obvious um, issues with these, their observational studies, reverse causation is probably playing a role here. The other issue with these studies was how they ascertained uh, sodium excretion. So they use something called the Kawasaki formula. And remember, it's the same group that published both studies. Uh, I had never heard of this before. Uh, this is the this is the formula. Uh, X sodium is um, spot sodium over spot creatinine times 10, and then multiplied by the predicted 24 hour creatinine based on these formulas for women and men. I've never seen this used clinically. Uh, what the authors stated based on 1,000 24 hour urine collections out of the 130,000 participants that they had was that there was an 11% error rate using that formula. But when other studies have uh, tried to um, validate this formula, it really does fall apart. So this is one of one such study. This was published just earlier this year in hypertension. It was over 10,000 participants all had 24-hour urine collections. Um, and when they compared the Kawasaki formula with 24-hour urine collections, 
The average over the entire cohort, uh, the difference was about 230 milligrams, but more importantly, the formula really fell apart at the extreme. So, so greater than six grams of sodium excretion and less than three grams of sodium excretion, the formula tend to fall apart. So it's hard to trust uh, the results of those studies beyond the fact that they're, they're observational. And so that brings us to the top study. So this was uh, published in 2016. Uh, this was um, a, a study of about 3,000 participants. They did utilize 24-hour 24 24-hour 24 urine collections for um, assessment of sodium intake. Again, observational study, 10 to 15-year follow-up. Um, the difference is the cohort was, was different than the other studies. These were pre-hypertensive individuals younger age, so 30 to 54. Um, the nice thing is each participant averaged three to seven 24-hour urine collections throughout the course of this, uh, throughout the course of the study. And what they saw was they did not see a J-shaped curve. They saw more of a linear effect with uh, ongoing decrease in cardiovascular events, even at the lower ends of sodium intake. You can see these 95% uh, confidence, confidence intervals really widen at the extremes. Uh, so only 10% of participants in this study out of the 3,000 um, had a sodium excretion under 2.3 grams, and only 1% had a sodium excretion rate um, under uh, one, or excuse me, under 1.5 grams. So what's the theoretic problem, particularly as it relates to patients with heart failure? So if you go back to the initial uh, Cochrane study. Uh, between 60 and 80 studies, uh, depending on whether it was Aldo or Renin, uh, um, reported those levels. And essentially, as sodium intake declined, renin levels and Aldo levels increased, as did sympathetic hormones like noradrenaline and adrenaline. And one natural way to maybe look at this is to look at the Yanomami or the Yanomamo tribe. Uh, so these are these are a uh, group of um, uh, these are a group of people that live in the Amazonian rainforest at the border of Brazil and Venezuela. They come into the uh, news periodically because of uh, threats to their way of life because of deforestation and miners after gold was found in one of the regions. Um, but what is important is they live this very traditional lifestyle that almost goes back to the Paleolithic diet. So this is. Uh, based on uh, urine studies from Intersalt. And so the Yanomami or Yanomamo here, and their 24 hour urine sodium excretion was 0 0.2 millimoles in 24 hours. Um, there's been a number of studies that picked Intersalt because it had the most uh, urine samples, but it's consistently around 0.5 millimoles or less. And they have, looking here, sky high levels of aldosterone and renin absolutely no hypertension um, and no known cardiovascular events. The issue is, um, I don't know how much of that is limited by life expectancy. Um, I actually couldn't find anywhere what life expectancy is um, in these. I think they are pretty uh, protected and so we don't we don't have a lot of, of data, but interesting nonetheless. And we know that in heart failure patients, neurohumoral activation is, is a big deal. So this is looking at just patients with compensated heart failure in red versus normal controls in blue. And even if a heart failure patient is quote unquote compensated, they still have significantly higher levels of renin, ADH, norepinephrine, aldosterone. And the reason is you need to do that initially to maintain organ perfusion that becomes maladaptive. And the vast majority of goal-directed medical therapy is blocking various parts of this cascade. So what are the studies we have in patients with heart failure? So the, the largest randomized control trials all come out of Italy. And one of the problems you're gonna see uh, very soon is that they all sound eerily the same. So this was published in 2009 by Paterna and colleagues. He's done the most work out of in this field. This was 410 patients. They all had an EF under 35%, and they were randomized at least 30 days after an admission for heart failure after achieving a compensated state. They were all on standard goal-directed medical therapy, and they were subsequently um, randomized 
to multiple things. So they, they created eight groups and the randomization was between a 120 millimole sodium diet or 80 millimole sodium diet. Also either a liter or two liters of fluid intake a day. And then either furosemide 125 milligrams BID or 250 milligrams BID. And then essentially created eight groups uh, with, with each um, combination of, of those factors. And what they saw over a 180 day follow-up looking primarily at heart failure uh, rehospitalization was that the group that was randomized to the more liberal sodium diet did significantly better with less hospitalizations. Uh, that was also true for the group that was uh, had, a, had a more intense fluid restriction and then also the higher um, uh, diuretic dose. Now a year earlier, the same group had published a randomized control trial of 230 patients, exact same criteria. In this cohort, uh, every patient had received hypertonic saline as an inpatient, and again, had a 180 day follow-up, uh, this time just randomized to either a liberal, which was defined as 120 millimole sodium diet or the more restricted 80 millimole sodium diet. They also saw a significant increase in, in rehospitalization if patients were on the lower sodium diet. Within the same group, uh, Perinello uh, published a, a trial in 2009 in the Journal of Cardiac Failure. This was also called a randomized control trial of 170 odd patients. Uh, exact same thing, EF less than 35%, goal-directed medical therapy, post-heart failure admission, uh, 80 versus 120 millimoles. Both groups received uh, either 125 or 250 milligrams of furosemide twice a day and a one liter fluid restriction. And what they found was that the group that was had the more liberal sodium diet of 120 millimoles, they had lower levels of BUN, higher creatinine clearance, and their plasma renin activity and aldosterone levels were significantly lower than the patients who were randomized to the 80 millimole sodium diet. Now, one of the issues here is that uh, there was a lot of controversy over duplication of data between all these studies. Uh, in fact, it was uh, retracted from one, one of the studies was retracted from one journal, subsequently published in another journal. Uh, when they were asked to present their actual data or you know, show their data, it magically disappeared. So it's unclear whether we can rely on these or not. Um, there was also the issue where the diuretic protocol was very rigid. So you can imagine that somebody is getting a lower sodium diet, they're on a high um, diuretic dose, and they were unable to change diuretic dose throughout the duration of the, of the study. And so that would also lead to hypovolemia and higher levels of um, renin and, and aldosterone. So there is a smaller um, systematic review of eight studies, or sorry, nine studies. If you take out the inpatient studies, it leaves us with six randomized control trials, very small numbers. Um, and they essentially, in four of the studies, they found no difference between sodium restriction and, and, and not uh, uh, restricting sodium. And the, the, one, the two studies that did favor Sodium restriction was really just small improvements in clinical symptoms. And so what we're left with is, I'm not sure, um, you know, how effective sodium restriction is. One of the reasons potentially, so we, I, we've used, you know, salt and sodium interchangeably. We know that uh, greater than 90% of the sodium intake we get is in the form of sodium chloride. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of the uh, chloride theory of heart failure. Uh, this has been shown more and more going back to 2016. Uh, Testani and, and his group out of Yale published a study looking at participants that were part of the BEST trial. So there was about 2,700 patients that were randomized to uh, basindolol or placebo. Uh, they had, all had NYHA class three or four heart failure, EF less than 35%, established on ACE inhibitors. Uh, and what they found looking at which electrolyte had the biggest impact on mortality, uh, and that was chloride. 
um, and the way they, they defined hypochloremia in the study was a, a serum level under 96 millimoles per liter. And in fact, we think about sodium a lot in terms of uh, at least having an association with poor outcomes. But in fact, when you corrected for chloride, the effect sodium had on outcomes was, was completely mitigated. And another study in 2015 looked at um, inpatients at the Cleveland Clinic over a five-year period. And what they did was stratify outcomes based on uh, admission chloride and sodium levels. And similarly, you can see in the bottom lines here, if you were hypochloremic, you had a decreased uh, survival rate, um, irregardless of sodium levels. And in fact, hyponatremia had no impact on survival if chloride levels were normal. So whether that's a possible mechanism for this or not, I don't know. Another possibility is downregulation of the uh, local intrarenal RAS system. Uh, this goes back to why does hypertonic saline work? We're not entirely sure, but possible uh, uh, hypotheses. So in conclusion, uh, I think we have insufficient evidence to recommend against dietary sodium restriction. I think it's clear that sodium restriction reduces uh, hypertension. Uh, the studies on cardiovascular outcomes are, are hard uh, because of the nature of them being observational, the way sodium uh, excretion was ascertained. I think the data in patients with heart failure is intriguing, but very unreliable for, for reasons that I mentioned. And I think we do, it, it would be interesting to see further studies. There is one ongoing trial that I'm aware of, and this is the sodium HF trial. Uh, they're looking at um, sodium restriction under 100 millimoles in patients with heart failure. Uh, I think they just finished um, uh, recruiting uh, in December. So hopefully we'll see results of this at some point, which will help uh, guide what we do. And so I'm gonna end there. If we have time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Nan. Uh, and definitely time for some questions. So people feel free to use the raise your hand function, uh, type in the chat, uh, got a big group, so. Don't be shy. I have one question to get things going, Nan. So um, obviously part of my interests are in the dialysis population. Are you aware of any studies looking at dietary sodium restriction in uh, dialysis, ESRD? I'm not, I haven't, I haven't run across that. Um, I'm sure other people in the audience may know that, but I, I, I don't. This is Raj, you guys. I, go ahead, Ian, please. No, you go ahead, Raj. You can follow. Oh, I was just going to make a next. quick historic note. Uh, you know, you, <clears throat> you talked about salt. Um, salt had an important role in India's war for independence against the British. Uh, the British levied the salt tax. And one act of defiance that Gandhi did was to march to the sea and make salt. Uh, and so the salt march is like, I don't even know hundreds of miles he walked for over, over two weeks. So just wanted to add that. Thanks, Josh. I, I was gonna ask Nan about the um, uh, synergy uh, between ACE inhibitors or RAS inhibitors and salt restriction. It's one of the motivations that's been provided for salt restriction as well. They make the antihypertensive effects of RAS inhibitors greater. Uh, did you find any credence to that? Yeah, so I, I don't know specifically, you know, the, the best way to answer that question. I know that we think about it a lot, um, you know, with our patients in terms of, you know, downregulating uh, particularly angiotensin II, which, which has such a prominent role in patients with heart failure. Uh, we've thought about it even inpatient for multiple reasons uh, because of all the, the proximal sodium uh, reabsorption they get when angiotensin II is, is active. And so, uh, I, you know, with with the data we have, you know, I think it is important right now in terms of to, to continue to recommend salt restriction. Uh, and that's, you know, probably helps the way, you know, ACE inhibitors work. Um, uh, the, well, that's this is besides the point, um, but there's a larger discussion about, you know, the use of RAS inhibitors as an inpatient, because uh, sometimes we run into trouble with people with low uh, cardiac indices, irregardless of hypotension, uh, because of the reliance of uh, maintaining GFR with efferent vasoconstriction, so that it's a little bit of a separate talk. Um, but in terms of sodium, I, I think there is a synergistic effect. Yeah, 
Looks like there's a, a question from Raymond. Raymond, do you want to just ask your question uh, out loud instead of having me read it? Sure, um, man, that was that was a really cool talk. That was totally amazing. So the question I had in some of these observational studies that you showed on the heart failure patients, is it possible that a urinary, low urinary sodium excretion is reflective of poor nutritional intake, um, unless obviously these patients are randomized to, to the low salt? Um, you know, similar to what we see in, in dialysis patients who have a low phosphorus, those are usually the patients who don't eat. Um, could that explain part of the increase in mortality or, or was that all looked at? Yeah, no, and I think you're 100% right. So, you know, again, even if you look at the observational studies, um, it, clearly there's confounding, right? The, the sicker the patient, the more likely it is that sodium restriction has been recommended to them. So it, it probably does reflect uh, dietary intake. We know, um, you know, most of these patients are going to be on diuretics. And we actually know that patients who come into the hospital on diuretics, their urine sodium directly correlates with poor outcomes. So the lower the urine sodium, the worse the outcomes. That's why we, we follow a lot of urine spot urine sodium levels in our patients to ensure that we get it to greater than 70. So part of that has to do with the decongestion effect. Uh, but but I think you're absolutely right that it that it is reflective of um, uh, poor intake and probably as a surrogate of of how sick the patient is. Thank you so much, Nan, uh, for for a great talk. Um, and we will move on. So.